every Monday morning we typically have a training session I call Monday Motivation. So who better to have than you for a Monday Motivation? So thanks for having me. You know, interestingly enough, I think my first question that I have is, seems you always have an on switch. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Right? When you feel that off switch, how do you go about turning it back on, especially when you have the Monday scaries? You know, I, I don't judge when the switch goes off, right? If like, you know, um, obviously we're just talking, like last night I lost a very, very good friend of mine and you know, the off, you know, it's hard to put the on switch on when real life starts to happen. Uh, or, you know, to make it a little bit less like, you know, about those kind of things. You know, I remember we lost the state of Texas. We got a letter in the mail from the state of Texas when I was in the wine business in Jersey with Wine Library. And because we were getting so big and I was getting so out there, our liquor store was getting picked on in gray shipping laws where nobody else was, right? And so we were getting these letters like, you can't do business here. And this one was a tough one, kind of, they worked the carrier and the state of Jersey and themselves. It was kind of like, oh crap. And like, just overnight, we lost $5.5 million in business and revenue, which was really tough because we were a small business in the scheme of things, you know, and I remember just going home at 3.30 in the afternoon and going to sleep. Right, because like 99.9999% of the time from a business standpoint, I can see the path to the chess moves to fix it. Um, I'm, I, you know, it's funny right now, there's so much in the air politically and I'm always like, look, I'll pay 98% taxes as long as everybody else who's as good as I am pays 98% taxes, right? <laughs> so like to me, it's about leveling, level playing fields in the game, in the, like of everything, as long as the playing field is leveled, I'm always kind of happy. In this case, with the Texas thing that I brought up, it wasn't. And, and that kind of like broke me a little bit. And so, you know, for me, to answer it, that was long-winded with some examples, I just don't judge myself if the switch is off. I, I really genuinely believe so much of what we can use to navigate happiness and success is predicated on not over judging ourselves in the micro. I, I really, I, I, and, and because I'm not willing to take other people's judgment on the, from the outside, all of a sudden I'm living in a very judgment free zone, um, which I'll be very honest with you, I think gratitude and the inability to judge myself are the absolute foundations to why I am who I am. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was Thanks, awesome. man. It, it's, it, you know what's really funny about it? Is it's super true, and one of the great things about not consuming, I don't consume a lot of content, um, but I read almost every comment I get about my stuff. I'm very insular. Like I never had a mentor, even my dad at some level wasn't necessarily my mentor. Definitely never read books about business, never really looked up to anybody. And, not, and, I, and I don't like talking about it much because I think it comes off a little douchey, but it's just my truth. It's ver- I'm very insular. And I think one of the things though that's cool about being insular is one of the reasons I think people gravitate towards my content is it's very personal, which means I'm talking about things sometimes that are a little bit not as common. I don't know, I just don't hear people talk about judge, I'm trying to talk a lot about judgment, especially because I think right now we're, with the way social media is structured, we're now seeing judgment physically, even though it's always existed. Um, And I actually, you'll find this interesting, I'm actually excited that we're living through a very outward judgment world because I think it's the beginnings of the steps of us eliminating hypocrisy. You know, just watching people judge each other on something like, oh, they're a cheater, but meanwhile they're stealing money. Or they're a, you know, they're a racist, but meanwhile they're like, you know, like the, everybody's got something. And you can't, you can't hide behind a curtain. I That's mean, it's the all be- right there in the public domain. I, I genuinely believe the best thing right now is that we can't hide. I actually genuinely believe most of society's shortcomings over the last 200 years has been the shadows, or probably forever for that matter. And so I, I do think the recognition of it's getting harder to hide does lead, to, I will, I'm very comfortable saying this. I'm a dram- Dramatically, I'm a solidly better human being because in 2007 I realized that I was gonna win on Twitter and social, like what's happened with me over the last 11, 12 years is something that isn't confusing to me because I knew what I was going to do and how I was gonna go about it and I knew that was gonna lead to people knowing who I was which 
fundamentally changed. And I was a pretty good guy and like my mom did a good job and I got the right DNA, but I'm, I'm very comfortable saying I'm a better person than I would have been if I wasn't aware of what was gonna happen and now I think everybody else is going through that now. I think everybody else is like, oh fuck, like, it, like people just know your shit. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I think that, so anyway, just got off track, but lack of judgment. So you're talking about content, right? You say yep. you don't consume a lot of content. So you have a room full of 25 people in real estate right now. Raise your hand if you're actually pushing content to the public domain right now. I'd say there's probably one of you, two of you, three of you out there. If you're not doing that, how far behind are you? You started in 2007, we're I, in 2019. I don't, I, don't, I don't think you're far behind. Honestly, I don't think you're stunningly far behind. I think you're just leaving so much on the table. This is not a game of like, oh, you're fuck, you know. You know why? You can't have that conversation with people who are successful currently. Like nobody hears you when you're like, you're so behind, you're like, I'm winning. Or if you're B2B, or if you start making up narratives that my customer's not on there, or who I'm trying to read is not on there. It's, a, it's leaving it on the table. I'll, I'll give you the comp. Um, me sitting here and saying, hey, I really think you should consider content, whether it's in video, written form on LinkedIn, you know, just shooting your shit of what you think about your space, the world, even your own journey, whatever it may be, would be similar to the conversation I had with one of my dad's best friends. So I was born in the Soviet Union. We came here in 78 and you know, people went to different places and one, a bunch of my dad's buddies went to LA and their hustle instead of liquor store was they drove cabs and eventually you know, they went from driving a cab to, you know, immigrants have it figured out, which is don't spend money on anything for a decade, save it all and then eventually buy something. Like that is literally the blueprint, it's as simple as that. Uh, and that's what they did, they drove cabs, saved all their money, lived in a shithole for five, six years and then started their own black car companies. I was an early investor in Uber. I called my dad's good friend, I said listen to me and listen to me good. I'm telling you right now, there's this new app and I think it's a problem. And I talked for seven or eight minutes about my thoughts about it and he basically responded in cliche, I'm doing well right now talk. Not old school talk. Uh, I'm not scared about how old somebody is with technology. I'm scared about how successful they are currently. To me that's the comp in this room, right? Because he kind of laughed it off and it, you know, it's kind of emotional because he worked for 40, him and his brother, they worked for 40 years hard, right? And they're just on the cusp Right, and their business is now worth a nickel on the dollar. It's crazy. Like, it's real bad. He sold his home. Like it, they got destroyed. And so, you know, you just—if you're not part of the technology game, you're—it's almost like you're not working out for a marathon that is clearly coming. And so, it may not be personal brand, but it may be something else. And if you're just not in it it's very hard to close the gap once the momentum starts. So let's talk about being in it for a second, right? You're probably the master of pushing and creating content, right? You're one of the most visible executives probably in the entire world right now. So I have a couple of questions. The first one is, what do you do when you run out of content ideas, right? So th that's the first question. The Let me just get right into that because it's probably gonna help people the most. Yep. This, this notion of documenting versus creating, which came up it's really funny, there's like this two hour interview with a kid on YouTube, it's like one of my most viewed videos and it's all because of that sentence, like 48 minutes in, it's not even in the title, it's crazy how good content always finds its audience. One sentence that came to me serendipitously in a conversation trying to answer this question for the 900th time, hidden in a video, became my most watched YouTube video because it's so true. Um, I don't run out of content because I just document my life. And then, and then we post, you know, at for, for seven years it was just me on my phone. I love when everyone's like, you have a team now. I'm like, I didn't. For seven years every day. But now what happens is I document it, we have post-production person look through it and we find clips, right? Um, you know, I, I don't think you can run out, you know, it's really funny, right? Because your industry on television has proven itself. There's a lot of industries I talk to, like a plumber, or the air conditioning companies, or like wherever the fuck I am, and like they can't make the connection, but your industry's cake. 
I, you know 30 personalities that have disproportionately benefited in their business because they've been on Bravo or Schmavo or whatever, <laughs> right? Yeah. So like Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and podcast is that. I mean, you can interview somebody 365 days a year. There are people you want to get to for business reasons that if you started a podcast and you emailed that tycoon, landowner, politician, who the fever, whoever, that if you emailed them and said, be on my podcast, they would say yes because people want vanity and awareness and now you've got access versus cold LinkedIn-ing and emailing and calling them and not getting any time of day. Just starting a podcast interviewing people Nobody fucking listening is good for your business. So how do you react to that when people reach out to you? Obviously you're here today. Yeah. So do you take these almost all the time? I mean because your time is valuable, no, right? No, so, you, you, I mean look, you know, this, you know this truth, like every part of me tried not to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's the truth, yeah, right? And you know, and first of all, it's rare for me to even say yes. I, I think maybe even the first or second time you saw that I was hesitant to say yes because sure. I don't want to not be a man of my word. But then even when I do say yes, you know, I'm comfortable saying this back to everything's documented. My admins can tell you this truth, so I got to tell you like 30% of those times I try to get out of it ultimately just because you're right, time is like my scariest thing. Um, and, but you know, I still do it. And I do it because one of the great things of being from, coming from zero is you have that context. And you think about the subtle times where somebody put you on, even if they don't realize they were putting you on, or if they do realize they were putting you on. I know that when I show up on somebody's podcast, because I'm running through the airport and I do a call for 15 minutes and they record it, that she or he then can use that to get 50 more guests that they never could. And once at a blue moon, once every 500 times, 300 times, 100 times, I'll just say yes, it's almost me paying homage to the game that put me on. Sure. It's the same reason I stop at almost every lemonade stand and give a kid 20 bucks, because <laughs> somebody did that for me when I was six, gave me a, t- I, I mean, I st- I, even just as I said that right now, I still felt it, like through my soul. Like I couldn't believe that dude gave me 10 bucks. Like 10 bucks was like a billion when I was six. Um, and uh, and I, I, so yeah, I do it occasionally. I love that. And being conscious of your time, I think what I want to do is maybe open up the forum to a couple of people in the audience. Um, and we really appreciate you being yeah, here. So, happy to do it. Who, who has questions back there? Gabe. Yeah, so uh, you've been on record recently talking a lot about how LinkedIn is yeah. the main, main network of the future. Uh, it, it's the current place where organic reach is disproportionately good. So, what, why is that? Uh, because I think they're being thoughtful, actually. I don't know. My intuition is, first of all, they made a great decision four or five years ago to not just make it a utility where people are just spamming each other on LinkedIn email and getting jobs, but they started putting out content, right? You know, I was lucky, I was, you know, I was in the world at that time, so I was one of those first hundred influencers and a lot of you know, that content got through and now anybody can do it. I think they're just being very smart and, they're t- you know, and they are helping that content populate. There's a lot of attention on LinkedIn, there's a lot of usage, and I think that they're realizing that Facebook's organic reach is down and that people always want organic reach. You know, like, you know, people have become seduced by social networks, it's great. Like, you can start at zero, put out a video, a picture, some words, and all of a sudden you start building an audience, but you can't once they suppress organic reach, right? And just to, you know, I'm, I'm jumping to conclusions. All these platforms, right, all of them, even email, if you're OG enough, start where everybody consumes everything at first. And it's free, and it's great, uh, and then over time, you know, a person who had 5,000 people on their Facebook page used to have 3,000 people see their post. All of a sudden, you know, over a course of a year or two, 800 people saw it. And they would get upset and mad and I would always yell at them and be like, it was free. You can't be mad at something that was free. Um, And then you start running ads because ads are underpriced. Uh, LinkedIn is right now just working. And it could stop tomorrow, which is why I don't use future, things of that nature. Right now, I'm only, you know, it's funny, I'm extremely practical. I only focus on where the attention is today. I'm more of a day trader than a mutual fund buyer, right? Today, LinkedIn is working. You know, tomorrow, I mean, my ebb and flow with Twitter, right? You know, loved it from 07 to 14, then got a little cynical about it, 15 to 18, now I'm hot, at, you know, just ebbs and flows, but I, I think they're taking advantage of Facebook's lack of organic reach and siphoning awareness. And what's really crazy, if you consume the content, 
LinkedIn now has all sorts of content. It's not just business content. People are posting their fitness workouts, their recipes, like there's just attention there. Any, any networks that we might not be aware of today that you are, or have already adopted? You'll appreciate this. This is why I always, like, I like where my place is and why I think the reason I'm building so much leverage is because I'm giving so much. I will never sit on anything. I, I will sit on something for a week or two just to make sure I'm right about it and then immediately I start blabbering. <laughs> right, like I've, I've, I've changed, like you, IP and information used to be my strength in 1990, you know, in 1999, 2000, when I was building Wine Library, all the liquor stores were making fun of me for having a website and an email service and I placated to that. I'm like, yeah, I'm dumb, stupid kid, you know, because the more time I had for them not doing it, the better. Now I'm in a place where I've learned about abundance. I realize, you know, like I'm building more competitors for myself every day, but I just, I feel like in return, I'm positioning myself in a very different way which leads to different things. So I always say, watch what I do, not what I say, right? So for example, here's a little nuance within. On linked, on Instagram, over the last month, you can see that I'm posting a lot more IGTV, you know, every second or third post than I ever did before. That means something's happening. Um, so no, I think LinkedIn for this crew is fucking really beast, really beast. True. Hell yeah, not only, not only that, Drew, I think about my content differently when I post on Instagram versus Facebook versus Twitter. I'm always reverse engineering the room. No, um, when I think about B2B, I think about bringing value to the other B in a world where they're always being sold to. Can you maybe extrapolate on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, when I do B2B marketing, I think of myself more like the B2B magazine than a human. So if I'm trying to reach a real estate developer, investor, I'm trying to think of myself as like putting out a piece of content that she or he would want to read in the Wall Street Journal. So it's less about I want to do business with you because you have the leverage, you're the B that I want, right? It's more of what the fuck can I bring you value in? And that may take research and work or let me go interview somebody, right? How do I get to Stephen Ross and interview him about what he was thinking about on Hudson Yards and then run that against other, run that, then I run ads on LinkedIn against real estate investors who look up to him. All of a sudden, who the fuck is that guy interviewing? They click my LinkedIn, I'm in the fucking game. Got it? This is only about bringing value. I, I always tell people, I'm like, why do, 70 year old billionaires have 34 year old pretty girl wives. It's a trade for both. I mean it. It's a raw example, but it's important to understand why it works. You have to bring value. What's the value that you're, you know, everybody here is like hunting, right? Like how do you bring value? And, and nobody th thinks that way. That, that's why I put out all my best advice. That's true value. There's a reason a lot of people are following me. It's not because I'm pretty or because I can like shoot a basketball or I'm good at music. Like People are following me on these platforms because they're taking the advice for free and then good shit's happening in their lives. Which is why when I get stopped at the airport, a lot of my friends are always like, man, or actually, you know what's interesting? A lot of other people with some level of fame or notoriety at basketball, they're, they're always fascinated by the way people come up to me. It's happened a lot. People with big audiences have asked me like, something's different. I'm like, what's different is I have admiration because I'm actually bringing value. That's why you're weirded out by how people interact with me. That's a different thing. I'm like, they like you because you're a fucking smoke show. They like you because you're fucking good at rap. They like you because you're an athlete, which is amazing. We all like those things but that's different than being admired because you're bringing value. I think you need to bring value, Drew. Like you need to think about what are they thinking about. Go fucking learn the tax code inside out and put out white papers on LinkedIn for them to save, on, you know what I mean? Like fuck, like if you title something, did you know real estate developers in Florida that you, there's a new law that you could like, that's a value to them. God forbid they didn't know and you put them on, you have leverage. I'm 
I'm not sure, that's a great question because that is what comes natural to me. Context is my platform. I'm, you know, it's funny, people focus on my content, no question the underlining strength I have is I'm so contextual, it's why I'm a good speaker. I always reverse engineer the nuance of the audience. Like every example I'm gonna give you is more contextual. Like these are very different talks when, you know, t- in, t- in two days I'm going to like an inner city school with sixth graders. I'm gonna use hip hop artists on SoundCloud as references. I'm very contextual. Um, for me it comes natural. You know, you, I do have one thing that just came to my mind. I just stay in my lane. It's super easy for me because I never talk about anything I don't know. Right, like it's just my lane. You know, I talk about what I know. People ask me sometimes left field questions at these things and I'm just like, my, I love, because I'm so hardcore and like act like I know everything. People are like, you act like you know everything. I'm like, no, I just know my thing. I'm like, go look at the keynotes on YouTube in the Q&A section where I say I don't know three times in a row because people ask me things that are not in my lane. And as I've gotten older, you know, when I was younger, I tried to like fake it more. I feel like I tried to figure it out. Now I'm just super comfortable. Like, I really fucking know wine you know, social marketing and the New York Jets and I really don't know anything else. (laughs) You know, and I stay there and so that helps me, right? When I switch, when I make a piece of content from the new Empathy Wine, it's easy for me. I know everything about it. I made it, for Christ's sake, you know? So, just stay in my fucking lane. And by the way, real quick, as salespeople, one of the great things I've learned in the last five to seven years is you don't want to lose with the 1%. Let me give you a really, really good one that I've never actually, I've never actually said this. You're filming this? Yeah. Uh, I need this. Yeah, same I've never l- ever said this. You don't want to lose with the 1%. If you're a great salesman, one of the things you learn as you get older, in my opinion, is when you've faked it or like tried to figure it out because you're with somebody that you like want to win over, you lose with the top 1% because they know. It's amazing how many people lose with me. I see a lot of people winning that have lost with me because in our interaction, they faked it. They were full of shit, and I know. I didn't let them know I knew. That's what 1% people do. It, it's incredibly powerful, and it's super hard for a salesperson to do that. It took me a long time to even get close to it. I'm still not fully there. I'm almost giving this advice to myself. And you don't call people out on their bullshit? I don't, because I'm not comfortable with confrontation. That's been a historically weak part of my management. You know, why? I'm just happier to like move on with my life and like, right. you know, like why make somebody feel small, you know? Um, but, I'm st- I'm, but this is my way to do it, right? Let me say it out loud to the masses. Like, you're gonna, don't lose with the 1%. So if you're in a big time meeting and you wanna win somebody over and they go to a place that you don't know, tell them, because it works. I love it's that. hard to do. Jamie? It took about five to seven months of doing Wine Library TV every single day in 2006 on YouTube. And then I recommended a wine that on a show, probably in that summer. So I started February 21st, probably July or August of that summer. There was some episode where I just really fell in love with some, you know, one of the great things about that show. So for context, in 2006 YouTube came out. I thought it was gonna be big. I started a wine show. That was the first time I really got put on. about nine, six or seven months in, on episode one I realized, oh fuck, I'm not gonna do QVC, I'm gonna do you know, Wine Spectator. So I just started reviewing wines, even wines I was selling in the store, even wines we had a lot of. If I didn't like it, I panned it. And that's why I got big. And that's where the transparency started really building for me as a salesman who would have said anything to sell as a 15 year old. You know, this, is, this was the next chapter of my career. Somewhere that summer, I recommend, I flipped for a wine. It was the first time I really fucking loved the wine on the show, because I really loved it. It was really remarkable wine, and we sold the fuck out of it. But not only did we sell the fuck out of it, the whole fucking country sold the fuck out of it. And I was like, and this is 2006. Nobody knew what the fuck YouTube was, and Twitter hadn't even started, and I was like, okay. And there was only a couple thousand people that watched it. You know, it was like, I remember it was like 1,100 views, and it was like selling, and I was like, okay, there's more, to this then. So it happened fairly quick. It was hard to like do a show every day for six months and not have any results. Um, Most people bail on content 
You know, everybody here has probably had some version of stopping and starting, potentially. Um, so, but honestly, I, um, I'm really good at eating shit. Like I'm really good if I believe in something, doing it in perpetuity. I really am. You know, it's kind of like why I started taking care of my health. Sure, I could see like I lost some weight or things of that nature, but like, it's funny. I saw I was flying to Naples for, you know, family thing, and I saw like three people like walking with a cane. I was like, this is why I'm doing it. Cool, I can see a little something now. It's not like I'm gonna be shredded, but I'm like, when I'm 74, because I had a really fucked up back from the liquor store, and I've really worked through soft tissue and working out and building strength, I'm like, this. I'm, I love that shit. I love building the foundation of a building. I don't like decorating rooms. I like pouring concrete. I love foundation. I love the shit that nobody likes. I really do, I really like it, because that's how you really win. You know, so that's, you know, I could have done it for nine years. I knew it was gonna work. <clears throat> I knew it. I knew that the internet was changing, that mobile devices were gonna change. It's the same reason that I'm so bullish on voice right now. I know that people are gonna buy and make decisions based on their Alexa and Google Home, that we're all gonna be in a voice world because it's faster than typing. I know it right now. I know in nine years that somebody's literally gonna say, Alexa, what's the closest open house to me right now? And they're gonna go and buy that house. So I know it now. So now I'm putting in the work, losing money. I put my money where my mouth is. My CFO's mad at me because we're losing money in our voice department. I'm like, I don't give a fuck about this year's P&L. I'm not selling this company. A lot, a lot of times uh, we emphasize the reach of yep. our audience. Then we go, oh fuck, where's our value? And you discuss here, hey, it's very important to bring value to this audience. But if you had this, what we call, this is our sales force, right? We're, we're out there selling. What about can you expand on the reach? How do we how do we best, you know, once we have our value, go out and reach today other than of course the LinkedIn and Well how do you do it now? Cold calling is huge. Cold calling, um, which is really why we emphasize the reach. Lance, Bless you. Lance runs a program where for two hours at night on Thursdays it's it's calling. Don't don't leave till you get off you know, till you get somebody on the phone. How do you emphasize reach once you have the value? Well, w- reaching more people, just what yeah, Branding, you're in sales. Yeah. Sales is hand-to-hand combat, I love it. I fucking love selling. Like I, I loved being on Insta- on all my live platforms on social the other night for four hours and I sold 113 cases of empathy and I was fucking pumped. <laughs> Worst ROI of my time ever. <laughs> pumped. I got I my lo- first box yesterday. You know, because I love the game. But selling hand-to-hand combat, how are you, good morning. Selling is amazing. But the best way of selling is building brand. There's no more fun, like I love the way I sell now. It all comes to me. That's, that's more fun. So, so that's why I think about content, because you're building brand. There's, you know, I'm pushing more people to do more hand-to-hand combat, right? I love cold calling. I, I think it's great. I just think that there's so much, like, I also think cold calling is leaving a comment on every single real estate piece of content on Instagram in New York. So it's the same, I love that shit. I love dirty hand-to-hand combat. It's actually how I built myself from 07 to 2011. Before I had a team, literally I'm a byproduct of one core move. I thought Twitter was gonna be big, so I went all in, right? And from 2007 to 2011, I went to sleep at four o'clock in the morning pretty much every night because I replied to every single person that tweeted at me, but at first nobody knew who I was. So 07 to 10, I basically jumped into every conversation about wine on Twitter. Like I literally would go at, like sit down at like 8 p.m. and go like legitimately for seven to eight hours and type in first wine. And then people like, you know, like this was early Twitter so it was a lot of Silicon Valley. That's how I got into Silicon Valley a little bit. I'm not even so sure that the most money I've made in my life investing in Facebook and Twitter didn't happen because I went into Twitter and was giving people advice on their trips to Napa. You know, it was only nerds on Twitter in 07. And they would be like, going to Napa this weekend to taste wine. I would jump in and be like, where are you going? And they were like, oh, and then they would see my profile and they would click on Wine Library TV and like this is just how it happened. It was hand-to-hand combat, I believe in it, but the most important counter for this room is brand building. 
Josh. What's up, Gary? Hey, Josh. What's your take on if you're an employee of a company, that company has their own brand, their yes. own social media, their yes. own content, promoting their content and their brand versus building your own personal brand within that? I think it's the company's responsibility to create a framework where you can create your own personal content. Here's why. None of your friends want to see that fucking company's content. Yep. So true. Like nobody believes in that cosign. Like that's the quickest way not to have an audience, right? You're peddling your company's shit, right? It has to be personal. It has to be valuable. And value comes in entertainment or education. Let me make this very clear. Value on content on the internet falls into two buckets. Education, entertainment, right? So it's interesting, I was having a conversation with one of the uh, C-level executives at my company and I was telling him, I wanna build my brand. And he said, Lance, back when I was younger, we called that reputation. Yep, right? I say that all the time. And I said to him, I said, cool. yeah, but I think nowadays, they're one and the same. Yeah, one of the biggest reasons I've been bringing up that point is because personal brand has a negative connotation. A good reputation has this evergreen great, so I just say great, call it, call it whatever the fuck you want. It's making content on the internet so people can see it so you can do business. But most companies want to suppress their employees. I'm promoting my employees. My fucking employees are getting LinkedIn job opportunities left and right because I keep showcasing them on my own content. I, I think that's power. Because the reality is even if I lose an A, that means 11 A's are behind it because they're watching what I'm doing. I'm speeding up the process of their career. Right? So like, that's smart. That's macro. Most people play defense, that's offense. You talked about the ebbs and flows of like uh, with, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. Yeah. Um, and it seems like you're down on Facebook right now and there's a lot of negative. You know what's funny? I love Facebook right now. I don't like Facebook's organic reach, but I love their ad product. We keep going. Yeah, so I was wondering what you think Facebook needs to do to turn it around because it seems like there's a lot of negativity surrounding it. Yeah, I mean look, the mainstream media has a lot of vested interest for Facebook's demise because it's the platform that's demising them. So I think there's a lot of very micro shit going on there. That being said, they own Instagram. They already did what they needed to do, yeah. right? It's why they tried to buy Snapchat. What Zucks is really good at is understanding that attention's the only currency, which is why if you look at his M&A strategy, we, you know, excuse me, uh, um, <clears throat> thank you. WhatsApp and even Oculus and things of that nature, like all that stuff, like he's always chasing the same thesis I'm chasing. Uh, so I love when people are like, Facebook's dead, and they're like, Instagram, like they own Instagram. Like it's really funny to watch people, like people posting shit about Facebook on Instagram. Like, do you understand? Like, you know, so, um, but Facebook's ad, I would tell you for this audience, my intuition is that Facebook's a better platform to run ads on than Instagram even. Um, mainly because there's a lot of attention 40 to 80 still on Facebook at scale, which is, there's a lot of business to be had in that. But you've gotta make it, this is back to earlier, Making Facebook content to do business takes more of a personal approach than you can do on LinkedIn, which can take more of a business approach. The content is the variable. When people say to me, Gary, I've heard all your bullshit, but it doesn't work, I'm like, no, no, no. It works, you're just not good at it. <laughs> you can make a billion dollars playing basketball. I can't. LeBron can. Facebook works, I know how to do it. You just might not, right? You've heard people say real estate's bullshit. They're like, they're not good at it. You're good at it. Right, I mean listen, cold calling, what, what I, this is a really fun conversation because I really believe that internet, hand-to-hand -hand combat, community management is cold calling 3.0. I really do, I really do. If you actually went into the, first of all, you, how many people are B2B, is this B2B, like B2C, help me here, B2B? B2B. Yeah. You know the fucking people you're trying to reach. People like you. How, right. How do we get to people like you? You just reply to the shit that I put out. Yeah. Like you just like, you become part of the community of the people that you wanna be with. It's like no different than trying to be cool in college. Like hang out with the people, like figure out how to hang out with the people you wanna be with. But you're putting out content where a lot of the other CEOs that you're trying to reach, and I'm not trying to be a nerd player, but like you, this is your business. A lot of the other CEOs that we're trying to reach aren't putting out the same content like you. Um, I agree, so, so you'll appreciate, and you, I don't feel this is nascing, this is adding value. So one of the things that I think all of you know is 
there's seven people that really influence my decisions. Marcus, Claude, Mark Yudkin. Like, what's really fun about not being able to reach CEOs is I've had more success engaging the influencer of the decision maker than the decision maker. That just takes work, right? But to your point, cool, but the head of comms puts out content. But the, you know, the charismatic lawyer in that firm for some reason decided to put out content. Plus, they're putting out content if you're like, it depends on how hardcore you're doing the work. Right, I landed a $7 million account because I engaged St. Louis Cardinals baseball with the decision maker. They're putting out their ski picture with their family in Aspen. And if you know anything about skiing and you say one thing about something, you just never, you know? And by the way, the conversion rates of adding comments of value on social versus cold calling, really interesting debate, right? Just it's a different skill. It's copyright, you know, but gift of gab on the phone translates to gift of gab in writing-ish. Not for me, by the way, I'm a weird one. Like, I'm great at talking, I'm terrible at writing. But the reality is, is that I really think there's a lot of upside. The other beautiful thing about leaving comments on social versus cold calling, other people see it. When you call somebody, that's you and her. When you comment, that's you and her and her social graph. The biggest problem is, the reason people struggle is cold calling is a right hook. Social media engaging is jabbing. If you go in for the sale on that first comment, you're finished. So you literally have to talk about like this, how good the skis are. And then you gotta come back a week, you know, it's like this whole, it's romance. spend a lot of time sort of overthinking and making stuff polished and awesome where you can just get it out there. Do you have an opinion on? Get it out there. Yeah, I have a very strong opinion. I think people grossly overestimate production value. Nobody gives a fuck. Just walk by, start talking, make stuff happen. Yes. I think people prefer it. I actually think fundamentally in this environment of speed, people over respond to raw footage versus production value. Listen, they both work. You make a fucking, you make Casey Neistat quality, you make really great YouTube videos, it's gonna work. But like that's hard and slow and, and more expensive. I think a lot of people are overthinking it in our industry because of who we target. We're targeting C-level executives, so everybody thinks they have to dot their I, cross their T's, when really you just want to put out good information. Is that what you're saying? So much. Video does over-index over pictures, pictures over words. You put three smart sentences in a LinkedIn post that is right to the audience you're trying to reach, go be stunned how much business that could actually bring. Like, you know, it, the information is what matters at the end of the day. But yes, if you're good on video, that will help more. Thank you. So, Gabe, what I've seen on, like, you're talking about Facebook, what I've yep. seen on Facebook is that it's kind of transitioned from a, like, talk to your friend and learn the people you know to a interest oriented um, platform. And, like, I think groups now are probably, in my opinion, the most dominant or interesting uh, development on Facebook. I agree. Yeah, Facebook groups are phenomenal. phenomenal. It's modern, uh, you know, forums. Yeah, and it took a really long time for us to get bored of uh, talking to our friends. We're not bored of talking to our friends. Bored, like, we still talk to our friends. We've evolved to where we talk to our friends. Yeah. So we've left, we've now went from Facebook talking to friends to intimate messaging platforms. Yep. And now Facebook has transitioned to this interest-oriented platform where interest-oriented platforms, you saw uh, the investor from Facebook, he started one, Airplay or whatever it was called. They've not really taken off. Well, tum- Tumblr was, Tumblr was, and, e- and even to a degree, Instagram started as one, right? It was a photography bit. The interest graph has always played. I would argue, like, you know, it's funny, this is what's so great about documenting. You can go look at, in 2009, 10, this is all I was talking about. I thought the interest graph, and I still believe that the interest graph is, is the dominant way to win mass. I think it's a subtlety within. I think, to your point, some platforms start very hardcore friendship like Facebook, but MySpace was stunningly interest and also friendship with that top five or eight or whatever the fuck we had. Friendster was friends. Inst- I mean, Twitter in a lot of ways was interest based because you would jump into conversations. Those are the two cores, right? Yeah, my point is like, so now it's Facebook's new approach, and I think it's like the group-oriented approach. And you'll appreciate this real quick because I want you to think about this. I, groups has been there for a while. It's not Facebook's approach. Facebook does tools. 
Like Facebook will give you a Swiss Army knife and then they'll watch what the fuck we do. Yes, yes, yes. I highly recommend if you want to do a Facebook strategy group that you join groups that actually matter to you. The, the toughest thing about forums and the extreme is Reddit is they don't like when you come in and try to take them out. You're a poser. So what would I do? I would join seven groups. The New York Rangers group, the, co- the whiskey group, the fine watch group, like shit that you like actually become part of the community live there for six months, and then find a way after six months of actually being part of it, being like, oh, I sell shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then advertise the, the, like You could, <laughs> but I, I think the toughest thing for salespeople in these environments is it's a romance play, it's not a close at all cost play. And that level of patience doesn't exist with most people. But my thing is like, get your nut off on cold calling on Thursday night and build brand other times. <laughs> like, like, it's not an either or. You need both, but I will tell you this, and I have no idea if you've ever felt it. I promise you, as a hardcore salesman his whole life, there's nothing more fun than when it only comes to you. So how do you weaponize it? So you go out, you like everybody's comments, you engage with people on LinkedIn, you respond to their stuff, you do all this stuff to engage and take the patience and the time and the hard work to build that platform. But first you have to mean it, right? Like, yeah, like, sure. like people think about it as tactics, even the way the sentence is right, set up. I don't like everybody's shit. Like people want to find ways to like scale it. To me it's thoughtful responses to things that you have answers to. For sure, but once you've done that and you do it with integrity and yeah. real true interest, yep. once you've done that, how do you then weaponize that to go for what you want? What because you want? in parallel you're putting out content. So, so you, real quick, back to the, I don't know if you caught it because I'm not sure when you came in. From 2007 to 2011 when I replied to every person authentically, hey me and my girlfriend are going to Napa, this is what people wrote on Twitter, right? Like, you know what they do. Like, I jump in, like, where are you going? They're like, oh, I'm on Davi. I'm like, that's bullshit. You need to go there. And I would give three answers. And I would, that was it. What happened was they would see that and then they would click my face and then they would go to me. And then in my Twitter was my latest episode of Wine Library TV. My latest hot take on why rose might happen in America or will never happen in America. You know, or whatever it was. And so in parallel, you're putting out content. So it's not like you do all this and then you go, it's you're doing this while you're doing that. Right. And then you make the call and say, hey, I think we've engaged a couple of times. No, <laughs> no, no, you don't. Like what's, what's they, the because you haven't done it, you haven't felt it. When you're doing the community management, when you are on your channel putting out content and occasionally putting out something like, first you're putting out six things that are valuable, but the seventh thing is like, hey, I've got this listing, or hey, I'm looking to place people. It's the people that you were engaging with when they come over, if they happen to be in that funnel, they're reaching out to you. Don't close in their environment. It never plays. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. Please, please. Um. My pillars are 15, 16 hours a day, Monday through Friday. Um, Weekends completely shut off. Six, seven weeks of vacation completely shut off. Extremism. Um, And then the way I fill the bucket of those 15 hours is 80% reactionary, right? What the fuck is on fire, right? Like I'm not in control. I got too much, I got 1,000 employees, I got fucking 800,000 fucking businesses, I got a lot of shit going on. And then, to the best of my ability, 20% of offense of where am I going, you know, and that's how I think about it. Yeah, uh, I'm starting to cut Fridays a little bit. Spend a little. My kids are now nine and six, so I'm starting to lean in even more. Um, and I'm actually rethinking this entire thing, to be honest. Um, I think it's really worked the extremism in the last three or four years. 
but I think the kids' activities and just their lives are starting to evolve into a place where my weekdays, I'm, I like being all in and all out. I, it really works for me. People are blown away that I can turn off on the weekend. It's cake for me. All in, all out. I can get real passionate about anything. You know, like I'm, I'm, you know, my, you know, your gifts are your curses. Like, you know, a lot of times people come up to me like, damn, like maybe you even sense it here. Like I'm here. There's like a lot of shit going on, but I'm fucking here. Like even like when I'm out, like cocktail party, like yeah, I like your, like I'll talk for seven, and I'm like fuck it. And people give me love for that all the time. Like man, you really like, you know, you get credit for it. And a lot of my like assistants, my executives, my family, they make fun of it. They're like, yeah, great for that person, but like shit was on fire, and we could have really used you to reply. Like, <laughs> you know, like, um, I, I, it's really worked for me. But I do sense like basketball practice and. Take, you know, I'm taking, my, I'm taking my daughter on a field trip. Like that's unusual for me this week. That's really unusual for me. I'm like in, out, but I'm starting to hack at it. But, and that goes back to the judgment and evolution and moments in time and today LinkedIn works. Like it's crazy. I've been thinking about something recently which is it doesn't seem foreign to me that I could completely check the fuck out. Like just literally wake up one morning and be like, all right, that was cool. Like that was, I'm gonna, not do anything for the next, like I'm putting out no fucking content for a year and I'm just gonna really like nine to five it for a year just to feel like maybe, maybe it's something like last night, like a friend passing, maybe it's a health scare, who the fuck knows? Like I will, I'm, I'm gonna live my life my way in perpetuity and whatever I've established yesterday has nothing to do with tomorrow. You know, I'm, I don't fear like mixing it up. I fucking ran a liquor store at 33 years old making $67,000 a year, building a business for my dad. Like, I can, I can fucking bounce around, you know what I mean? Like, so, yes, I wanna buy the New York Jets, but like, the chase of the Jets is the high, the process. It's like the people here who love cold calling. It means you love the process. The chase. The chase, yeah. you know? And the ones that don't, don't. And that, they do it for the money, or they feel like it's the tactic they have to do within the framework of the company they work in, which is fine too, that's life. But like that's the difference. How does your family like do they have any impact on how this like is the grind ever been too much for them? Yeah, I mean it's y- yes, but wife. Yeah, I mean they're different, right? They're different entities, kids versus wife, wife over communicating, kids like I've enjoyed the years where they couldn't talk, right? Cause you couldn't, you couldn't get the feedback loop of did they care or not. My daughter ultimately like didn't give a shit as much. My son she, like pushing a little bit back, like, Ugh, you know, like that fucking hurts going out the door. Like, yeah, it all evolves. But one thing that is very real to me is if you're not happy, you're not gonna make anybody else happy. And so I've, uh, there's, a, there's a real blend of selfish and selflessness in what I just said. And uh, I'm comfortable with that. Like I can't, I would die if I couldn't be me. I know that. The one thing I know about myself, that's why I was a DNF student. I'm a smart dude. Like I could have done what everybody else did and got B's and A's and went to Michigan and Maryland instead of Mount Ida College, but I couldn't. Like I'm so me, for real, for real. And so it scares me that I'm willing to like, like lose things for not going into like, I'm just incapable of being anything but myself. I think, I think that is just super weird to me myself even when I analyze myself. Like why is that? Like what, what is that? Um, so they have, an, they have a, I consider it, it's where I found my extremism, like I've tried to like, but like even the process of like, who do you want to spend your life with, like I've always been thoughtful of it and always communicated it, you know? But things change. Like I, I didn't have my wife sign up for in perpetuity, I knew in seven years or 13 years or 22 years, she might change, I might change, I might change tomorrow. Hey Gary, I uh, appreciate you taking my question and uh, sorry to hear about the loss of your friend. Appreciate it. Yep. when you leave here today, when we get back to our office or tonight when we put our head down to sleep, what is it that we could do moving forward? I think getting into a place where you're putting out content for the world matters. It's going to become more, not less. Like every day that goes by, it's going only in one direction. So self-awareness. Figure out who you are and think about, okay, if I'm gonna take Gary up on this, if I'm gonna call his bluff, what am I most comfortable sharing? For example, I don't know how many of you follow me, I don't put out any content about my family. You wanna get a bunch of cheap likes and grow your audience? Put out your kids. 
right? Like, and my kids are characters. I'd be killing it, you know. Like, <laughs> but but we've decided not to do that. That's that's you have to be you. Like, you don't have to do what I do. You have to do what you do. But you have to know how you communicate. Maybe you are good at writing, and that's how you're going to go about it, right? Maybe you don't want people to stop you in the streets. Maybe you do want to hold on to your privacy, even though I'm saying it's getting harder. So cool, written word, audio is great. I mean, the memos thing on the phone—you just have a good thought. Like every good thought you have, every good idea. Like you also don't know. Like I started as a wine retailer. I'm in a different place now. Like you may put out one piece of content that actually allows you to coach a basketball team. Like, I'm not kidding. Life is weird. The internet is at scale. And it would, you'd be stunned. If nothing else, let me throw a real curveball to you. One of the reasons I, so when I started my vlog three years ago, Daily V, there was people like Casey Neistat and other YouTubers that were doing personal vlogging, right? Small camera, they went around, you might know this trend. I was kind of the first person that had somebody following me. Super narcissistic and douchey. Like, it, I, I sat on it for like three months. I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna just walk around Earth with somebody. Like, I was, even for me, who doesn't you take judgment and like has been able to not have peer pressure, I was like, fuck. That's kind of like, I gotta get ready for some real cynicism. Like, that's, you, like you're really a fucking narcissist if you're willing to go there. And I, I don't feel that way. And so it was like tough, but I still did it. And here's why. Not because I knew what was gonna happen in business, which I did and it happened, which was, it was gonna disproportionately grow my profile. It's because I lost both of my grandparents, my grandfathers, I know nothing about them. Like God willing, forbid, it would've been so rad if they would've made the same leap and I could like watch all, like it's crazy how cool putting out content is when you're older. Like if nothing else, it'll be super rad for your grandkids to like read your thoughts. Like, you know how fun it would be right now if social media existed? Like, you know how cool it would be to see like what Steve Jobs was talking about that first year? And forget about, that'd be cool for us. How about just like, um, just imagine all the shit that you've put out if you put out shit on Instagram. Just imagine if your great, great grandparents had that. It's rad. Just on a personal level, it's rad. For you, me and my brother, you know, my brother's my least fan because he's my brother, right? Like, like he doesn't want all this content. He hates all this shit. He doesn't watch any of my stuff, he, you know? But we were at Super Bowl and D-Rock was with us and for some reason he pulled up episode four, which is three years ago. And we were, we were mesmerized, him and I. Like, just three years ago. Remember her? She got fired and that was crazy and that was the day we lost the account. Like, like just that. So, like, you know, I, I couldn't be more bullish on putting out information on the internet but you have to be self-aware of what, and you have to talk about what, but I know it leads to business. I see it every day. So you're saying like, if you might feel a little narcissistic when you make these comments, you make these like selfie videos, don't look at it that way. Look at a, my existential, like a legacy maybe, I, and you I do. will yield the same result. And, and even bigger to the point, brother, like yeah. don't live your life based on other people's opinions. Yeah. Like at its Amen. most, senior, at, you know, like at its most intense. Like now, if you feel like you are being narcissistic, like that's how, you know, then don't. Yeah. But like, you know, don't, most people aren't doing it because of what they think other people are gonna think about them doing it. You know? Yeah. I really, I really mean that. Like, especially with like, listen, I'm very popular with young men on Instagram. I control the fact that I don't put out content with cash in my hand and Lamborghini. Like, you can control, like people, you're so narcissistic. I'm like, cool. Like, in real conversations, I'm like, cool, but like, do you watch what I put out? I feel good about me putting out content around gratitude and kindness and empathy. And oh, by the way, you know, this is when my, some of my most socially liberal friends razz me for certain things. I'm like, by the way, I'm making an impact. You know what, you know what 17 year old dudes that think I'm cool getting that propaganda is versus watches and models and bottles and like, I'm doing good shit, right? So like, I'm not putting out pictures of me laying in a fucking blow up swan drinking rosé. <laughs> like, you control what you put out. And so like, yeah, like, like, you know, like, do I like to hear myself speak? I sure do, so does every single other human. Like that's exactly right. And so yeah, I think you have to reframe the perspective, right? Legacy. Legacy. I'm not very big on putting out content like other people. Like yep. I try to keep my private life. Private. private. Um, 
and just be, as you're building, like my private life is so private, it's uncomfortable. People are uncomfortable with how private, because I put out so much other content. You're in control. Do you have separate channels? No, that's stuff? how private I am. You only put out stuff? Stuff? No, I don't have a Finsta, I don't have anything. Like, m- like we are private, like there's like two pictures of my kids on the internet. Like we just keep it private. That's what's so crazy, how, this is back to me being like a contradiction extreme, like, like I'm the most out there and probably like, there are very few, unless you do not have accounts, for anybody that has accounts, I put out less family stuff than anybody on earth. Volume. Yes. So, you know, you, you do a daily vlog, right? But do you think that, that once a day is it or, you, or do you think like what Grant Cardone does of like 50 things a day, where do you fall on that continuum of I I think the more you, c- I think it's about, are you putting out something worth watching and listening to. So I always think about you know, Vine. Those were six second videos and there was plenty of videos that after three seconds I stopped watching. And then I think about Star Wars Episode 10. I keep saying, if Star Wars Episode 10 was seven hours, I'd go in the theater, sit down for seven hours and watch it if it was all, like Avenger, the next Avengers, if you heard it was six hours, if you're fucking all about Avengers, you're pumped to go watch it for six hours. So quality, isn't predicated on quantity, it's predicated on talent. So if you have something good to say, even if it's three times a day, get it out there. I, I believe that. But watch your audience, right? Don't have audacity or be in your own self. You gotta watch. It's a fine balance of like, if I listened to my audience, I would have met faster horses, that thing. Like, have your conviction, but you also have to listen to the market. Your consumer is always right. Yeah. Subject. I, I run the gamut. I mean, I had one recently. I mean, I came out and said, I don't think anybody should buy a home. That they should just rent. That didn't go over super well in the commercial real estate, uh, the residential real estate space and fucking every single personality had a hot take on it and like, I got tens of thousands of people who DM'd me and emailed me and private messaged me and said, you know, fuck you, I'm never listening to you, I hate you, you're trying, to, you're trying to ruin my livelihood and like all sorts of shit. And in that case, I made a video and said, look, I was doing an interview and like I, sh- I could have done a better job contextualizing it. I said I wish I didn't because all that capital I put in down payment, if I stayed on the offense, I would have poured more money into Facebook, Twitter and Uber and it would have changed the course of my life. And uh, you know, and so, you know, I, I avoid it, I jump into it. Like, you, yeah, you, to me, I make subjective calls every time I'm involved with it to try to figure out if I can have a rational conversation or is this just an irrational, you know, trolling session. Awesome. How much more time do we have? Uh, well, I want to be conscious it? of your time. What time it's it? uh, 8.30. Okay, five, 9.30. Oh, not 30, sorry, 9.30. But we can go five more minutes. Yep. Go ahead, brother. So, um, <clears throat> I, I like blending interests. I do. I think it shows a more three dimension. My, I'll give you. It's funny where my head went when you're asked. It went to everybody's Instagram. Excuse me, everybody's uh, LinkedIn profile picture, right? Like, like I feel like we over professionalize way too much. I think that um, I, I I like mixing. I think a lot of reasons why. There are people who do business with me because I am a Jets fan and because they learned that in my channel, right? Like, I, I think you posting something about cars is probably a more likely reason you'll get business than not. It humanizes I, I like, you. It humanizes you. It shows, I mean, it's how business is done, right? Like, if you really think about back to like, this is just scaling old school, like, there's a reason you go out to dinner with your clients. There's a reason you golf or go to a ball game. It's when you start changing the conversation into something personal. Like you knowing that their boyfriend's name is Rick or that their wife's name is Carol has a lot to do with why you get the business. And I think mixing you know, your interests into your feed has a lot to do with that as well. A uh, couple recommendations. Give us a good book recommendation and a podcast that's not your own. <laughs> so you'll appreciate this. I think I, I'm glad I established it earlier. Like I don't consume content. I can't give you that recommendation because I don't know. I don't, I've not listened to a single episode of a podcast in my entire life. How do you, how do you learn though then what the culture through the com- is changing? Through the comments. Real, real feedback loop. The, the number one reason VaynerMedia is such a big time agency is because none of my agency competitors or any of the biggest corporations in the world are actually consumer centric. 
I spend all my time consuming actual people's responses to actual things. A lot of my own, and then when things happen in culture, right? So like when a Netflix show explodes and I know it's in the culture, I'll go to Twitter and I'll go to Instagram and I'll search the hashtags. I know, I, I knew, I read over, I don't know what it was, 5,000 comments and hot takes on Cardi B before I even knew what she looked like. <laughs> right? Right? I consume, I consume the way people consume. Got it? That's really been my historical advantage. Yeah. <laughs> let me, let me, anybody who ha- hasn't asked a question that wants to, I know there's, uh, I'll sneak some more in because I, I got a minute or two buffer. Anybody who hasn't asked a question that wants a question? No, all right, go ahead, bro. If you're a, let's say, 22 year old kid, you're yep. just starting out in your job in sales, you don't necessarily have the experience yep. to, to truly provide value right off the bat, what advice would you give to that person to, to start conversations and start with sales? Owning that truth. It's what I told my sister when she went into residential real estate like six months ago or a year ago. I was like, own the fact that you don't know what the fuck you're doing. It's the most endearing thing. What I would do is I would, back to like in parallel, I would document the journey of learning and I would spend an ungodly amount of time with people in the game and listen. Talk about your truth, your excitement about learning. I really wish I had it when I was coming up, right? Because I would have done that. I would have been like, it would have been really cool to see that first year when I was running the liquor store because I was 22, about 21, about to be 22. uh, I knew everything about wine on paper. I mean everything. More then than now. Everything. But I couldn't taste wine for shit because my parents were super hardcore, like don't drink. Everybody died from vodka in Russia so my mom was like super about it. And so I really didn't drink that much in high school or college at all. So like I would taste wine, now I'm in it, right? Now I'm gonna be the greatest wine ever. Now I'm in it and that first year, it just tasted like wine. Like all the shit I read, like chocolate and clovers and fucking all this shit, I was like, what the fuck? It's just wine. I can't taste shit, it was devastating. And I, I always wonder, would I listen to my own advice today and tell the truth and be like, it's just fucking wine? Would I, was I more, of a bullshit version of myself back then, I would have faked it, I don't know. People want to fake it. Um, But I would document the journey of becoming good at it. Because that ammo in 20 years, one of the best, how many people here follow me on Instagram? It's okay if you don't, I'm just curious. So I don't know if you guys noticed, about four, three months ago, I started doing the clips where I would show you something I said in 2009, and like, that shit carries weight. That's what's great about documenting, the recall, you know? That shit carries weight. When you can, like when, when I talk about gratitude in 2009, now people are like, oh, you're not just doing this to get likes on Instagram, you know? It, ma- it matters, or like my predictions, or like, fucking matters. You said um, you shut off, you shut off, you shut off. Like, do you, I'm wondering what you do, curious. Do you meditate, do you go have a cocktail on the weekend? Do you go get a massage at a, I don't know, what do you do to I, really- I go with the same passion that I go for work on whatever's happening. Like. Family time, just like catching up on family. Or like like this weekend, I was all in on March Madness because my whole family's all in on it. You know, my wife's bracket's really going well, so she's pumped and my little guy's now like cried like a fucking baby because Duke got knocked uh. out and he had them winning. And I'm like, cool, I love the competitiveness. I'm like, but you're not gonna be a fucking Duke fan. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like no bandwagon around here. Uh, you know, but he's only about Zion for the Knicks. And I'm like, dude, you Sick. don't even know the one fucking year we did it right. We don't even have the right odds. It's all fucked up. <laughs> Trying to prep him already for that ball not bouncing our way. Um, it could be anything, yeah. right? So it's less about, I'm comfortable to be on my phone, but I don't look at my, I really don't, it's, it's not because I try not to look at I just don't have a vibe to look at it, right? Like, like look at my work stuff. Like, I can have my phone. I have my phone. I, uh, I uh, am in a hardcore fantasy baseball league. Like, hardcore. Like, backup pitchers, 40 people, team, like, hardcore. So, like, two hours of, like, fucking digging into every box score, what every human did, because it's the first weekend when you can pick up free agents and it's an important Sunday night. You know, like, whatever the interest is, right? Yeah. So I want to be conscious of your time. You have been super, super gracious. So I think Gary deserves a round of applause after that that performance. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, guys. That was so awesome. Thank you so much. Got to run. Got to run out.